Mr. Gorbachev, open this gate. You're from East Germany originally. Yes. Before I the am. wall came down. Yeah. There are pieces of history you hear about in school or read about in books that don't seem totally real because it's so hard to believe that they even existed in the first place. For me, one of those things is the Berlin Wall. Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. It's a story that has an incredible ending. A story of good triumphing over evil, even though evil tried its hardest till the bitter end. A historic moment tonight. The Berlin Wall can no longer contain the East German people. And then, in the middle of nowhere, in a tiny cabin in the backcountry of British Columbia, for me, that unbelievable story came to life. You just lived your life. You need to go on. You need to go on. No matter who you are, no matter what you want your life to be, you're gonna be a star. Willie Nelson. Rolling like a VIP. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're living like a rock star, baby. Cut. Previously on Nick's Wild Ride, I made it to British Columbia. I hunted with this German and this guy from Georgia. I was hunting for these mountain goats and I found this guy. And on day four of my hunt, this is what happened. Yep, that was a good day. Now let's fast forward. Myself and my two guides, Marcus and Brett, we're all back at base camp with fresh meat nasty feet, and sadly barely enough whiskey to go around to celebrate our success. That's all what I got say. That's all you have left? That's all what I got left. You'll share it? Of course. Good man. I'm not sure I've ever been so happy for a cap full of booze in my life. <laughs> Cheers. Wise man's aisle. Cheers. Hunter's luck. You brought us a big pile of meat home. <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking forward to that too. And speaking of meat, Guess what we had for breakfast? Yep, goat meat. Our first home cooked meal in close to a week, and it was awesome. But this is life in the lap of luxury compared to the way the storied mountain men of this area live their lives. For generations, men scraped out a living in these parts, trapping and hunting things like beavers and wolves. In the early to mid 1800s, thousands of them took to the mountains employed by major fur companies, often at great risk to life and limb. I can't even imagine what that must have been like, but after days of eating dried food and goat meat, I can tell you that I'm glad I can play the fiddle. And then I had an idea. I've had nothing but mountain house, which is dried food, and now goat meat, and I'm sick of it. So this is my savior. I am a catch and release kind of guy, especially for trout, but hate to admit it, tonight, my friend, you are a welcome dinner. Just like that, in less than 10 minutes, I have dinner. Watching Marcus do his thing is like watching a true master at work. There are very few things to work with in this kitchen. That's rendered goat fat. He's got a thing of mustard. Creative is the name of the game. Right now it smells so good, after what we've been eating. It could be fish poop and I'd be happy. After a successful week in British Columbia, the question becomes, where do we go from here? And the answer is we begin our hunt for an animal that says Canada all over it, moose. There are six subspecies of moose worldwide. They live on three different continents, North America, Europe, and Asia. The United States has a population of around 300,000 head of moose, and most of those live in Alaska. Canada has the largest population of moose in the world, estimating between 500,000 and a million head. 
two days of solid weather have us pinned down at base camp, which is fine with me because we get a chance to clean up, warm up, and the opportunity to sit down with Marcus and learn a little more about his fascinating life. How many years have you been guiding? In Canada, 12 years, yeah. Before I was guiding in, let's say, almost all over in Europe. Yeah. You're from East Germany originally. Yes. Before the wall came down. Yeah. In 1945, after World War II, Germany was split up into blocks of land that were controlled by the Allies. The eastern part of the country went to the Soviet Union, while the western part went to the US, Great Britain, and France. Even though Berlin was located 100 miles inside the Soviet-controlled portion, it was also split into similar sectors. This became a proverbial bone stuck in the Soviet's throat. You see, the communist Soviets absolutely hated the idea of a bustling capitalist democratic city right there within its own borders, wide open for all of those living on the oppressed Russian side to see. If you were sitting there with no money and no food and you knew that on the other side of town there were jobs and restaurants, where would you go? You grew up on the, the rough side of on, the tracks. Yes, yeah. exactly, on the Russian side. Yeah. By the late 1950s, Tens of thousands of refugees per month were fleeing East Germany for West Germany through Berlin. On August 12, 1958, Premier Nikita Khrushchev had had enough. He ordered the closing of the border for good. And over the coming months and years, a permanent wall was erected, dividing not only Berlin itself, but families, friends, and fellow countrymen. And this led to the harsh conditions that Marcus grew up in. We had our rough times, you know. There was not, like, always food available. There was a lot of stuff rationed, but we had one TV in our village. Guess what was my best show, what I loved as a kid? What? Grizzly Adams. Grizzly Adams. Yeah, Grizzly Adams <laughs> inspired me on the end to go to Canada. Really? Yes, it did. Ben! That's right. Good old Grizzly Adams and his huge bear Ben are the very reason that Marcus is sitting here today. I guess I owe thanks to Grizzly Adams and thanks to the guy who owned the TV. Where was this TV in your village? In somebody's house? Yes, in somebody's house. And everybody they, would pile into their living room? All and... the kids. And that guy was actually a pretty smart guy because he built an antenna to get connected with the Western TV. So he was picking up Grizzly Adams from yes, the Western side exactly. over the wall. Did you hunt in East Germany? We hunted, but today we would call it poaching. Really? Yeah, because we need food. So you weren't allowed to hunt? No, just members of the Communist Party was allowed to hunt. And, and that's how you learned to hunt, was yeah. literally to For put food. food on the table. Exactly. But it was poaching. Would you have gotten in trouble if you'd, if you'd gotten caught? I never got caught, but if, there would be big trouble. I really? mean, really big trouble. A like, jail. Really? Yeah, even for kids, and not just that guy who did it. I mean, the whole family. Really? Yeah, they was pretty strict on that wow. stuff. Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. In the late 80s, mounting international pressure led by President Ronald Reagan began to erode Russia's will to keep Berlin separated. And finally, on November 9th, 1989, the Russians relented. The people rose up, and the Berlin Wall began to fall. More than two million people from East Berlin visited West Berlin that weekend. One of those people was a young Marcus. After the wall came down, so we drove over to the west side of Germany. So at that time, all the grocery stores, they gave food away for free for us. And so there was that one lady and he had a box full of potatoes. And she said, oh, you guys want to have that potatoes, they're for free. Then you we, probably hadn't seen a whole box of potatoes in years, not, right? E yeah. Exactly, and not, in that, and not for free, yeah. right? That potatoes to us was strange looking, eh? Hairy, like typical potatoes. Mom put it in a pot and started to boil the potatoes, and then she said, something is wrong with the potatoes. They're totally green. We tasted them, hmm, and they're sweet. And then we found out that's kiwi fruit. <laughs> the hairy potatoes, they kiwi fruit. They, and the whole time you thought they were potatoes. Of course we did. <laughs> so you've never, never seen a kiwi fruit. Never seen a kiwi fruit before, yeah. So you learn to hunt basically by poaching. Now basically, the wall yes. comes down and you're able to travel freely. Yeah. Did you immediately start pursuing other hunting other places? No, I'm a nurse. Really? Yeah. You look more like a male model than a nurse. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> but I could be a nurse in a miniskirt too, right? From, from behind. <laughs> look at that beautiful woman. And then yeah. you turn around, oh, oh my God. Oh, yeah. oh, <laughs> Later on, I came over to Canada. To follow same. your Grizzly Adams dream. Ex exactly. And here you are and here we are. Yeah. Unbelievable.
Man, I'm not gonna play with you, not now, no sir. Here in British Columbia, the nasty rain and wind have now passed us and it's time to get out after what we came here for. It's September 15th and I killed a big old mountain goat two and a half days ago. It's been raining ever since, which has been really good because we've had a break. Now the sun is out and it's three days till my 40th birthday. And I have three days to kill a moose. I have relatively little experience moose hunting, but it doesn't take long to see that in certain ways, it's a lot like elk or turkey hunting. During the rut, you head to where you think bulls might be hanging out, and then you make the sound of a female. What does a cow moose sound like? Well, here's Marcus's best rendition. It's pretty sexy. Not sexy enough. <laughs> Another way to call in a bull moose during the rut is to emulate the sound of another bull moose. To do this, you try to sound like an aggressive bull who's rubbing his antlers on trees and brush and everything else. Basically, you take a paddle and you beat the crap out of everything around you to make as much noise as possible. I don't know what the hell I'm doing. The next day, we make a plan to cross the lake and pitch a tent. Then we'll operate out of that spike camp looking for a bull or the young lady that he might be looking for or the old lady he might be looking for. We spent the day hiking, glassing, and hunting. And then when we got back to camp, we spent the final hour of daylight glassing from there. So Marcus took that opportunity to get nice and comfortable. And he proves once again that he's one of a kind. Hey Marcus, is this some kind of new camouflage? Yes. What do you call it? The ghost bull. The ghost bull? Yeah. Uh, I like it. Trendsetter. German. British Columbia moose hunts go back to the First Nations, who relied upon moose meat as a major source of protein, as well as using the dried hides for shoes, clothing, and shelter and they also made tools out of the bones and antlers. As the light begins to fade, I try to take things seriously as Marcus seriously calls for moose in his Ghostbuster pants. Seriously, you can't make this stuff up. Anyway, we didn't manage to call in a moose, but we were surprised to hear a wolf howl. Suddenly, the guys change calls and begin calling back to the wolf, which I figured would never work, until it did. Ancient Romans tied the wolf with Mars, who was their god of war and agriculture. The Pawnee Indians believed that the wolf was the first animal brought to Earth. In China, the wolf was traditionally associated with greed and cruelty. And let's not forget about Little Red Riding Hood and the Big Bad Wolf, who was out to get her. Whether it's folklore, religion, or mythology, humans have had a fascination and a love-hate relationship with wolves since the beginning of time. The unfortunate truth is that those humans decimated the population of wolves in the early 20th century. The controversial practice of reintroducing wolves into the lower 48 states has seen the U.S. population of wolves climb to over 18,000. In some of those areas, the wolf population goes unchecked and in turn can be devastating to not only cattle, but to big game animals like deer, elk, and moose. Canada has over 60,000 wolves, and in most places has some sort of active wolf management program in place. Native American stories and culture tell us that humans have always played a role in managing herds of animals. The goal is to make sure that there is a balanced place for everything. But that's a delicate balance too, because as we've learned, when you protect one population of animals, it often affects the population of another. In this part of the world, wolves are considered overpopulated. 
and that has affected the populations of moose and caribou. Before this moment, I had never really considered hunting a wolf, and now I find myself in a very unique situation. Native American culture has a fascinating symbolic relationship with wolves. They imitated the wolves' hunting methods and valued them as proud hunters, loyal friends, and intelligent teachers. But they were also wary of the fact that at times, those same wolves can be problematic. And now, as I take the long walk to recover my kill, I find myself reflecting on that spirit and those very same sentiments. And if I'm honest, I feel a little conflicted. I'm filled with contradictory senses of admiration, satisfaction, and even a tinge of sadness. And it's a moment that will stick with me forever. It's getting dark fast, and I'm presented with a problem. Desperate times call for desperate measures. That's cold. You can call me a sissy all you want, but those are my family jewels in the cold water, not yours. And it was all worth it when I came back across that water with this on my shoulders. Well, there's a first time for everything. And I can promise you that shooting a wolf at 500 yards and then going and picking him up in my underwear is definitely a first. Look at that guy. What a beautiful animal. Obviously they need to be controlled, but when you sit right next to one, you can't help but appreciate how beautiful of an animal these guys are. But we're helping the moose population too. The next day we wake up to a frosty morning. That's frost on my hunting pants. That's our water for the morning coffee. But we make do with what we have. Oh, and one more thing about this day. Today is my 40th birthday, and the guys pull out all the backcountry stops to help me celebrate. Seriously though, this far into the hunt, there are no more sweets left, and we're almost out of coffee. In an act of complete selflessness, these guys have held onto these treats for this moment for a week. Now that makes a guy feel special. You don't realize, but this is almost better than this out here. This is a good way to spend your 40th birthday right here. Moose, good friends, and life is good. Oh, there's a cookie under there too. It tastes way better out here. Now, what would a guy on his last day of a moose hunt wish for on his 40th birthday? <laughs> yep, that's it right there, a bull moose. And we spent the entire morning watching moose. And while I show you the moose we saw on my birthday, I'd like to play you a special tribute to my friend Marcus, the German national anthem. While we saw three bulls that morning, none of them were mature enough to shoot. And that's okay with me, because most people spend their 40th birthday with a huge party and lots of people. Mine was spent in the middle of nowhere, doing something I love more than anything, with two guys I met 10 days ago. And yet, they feel like family to me. And for me, that's all I could ask for. I said goodbye to another decade this year and celebrated it with two guys on the side of a hill wearing five-day-old underwear. Some people talk about this milestone like it's a death sentence, but for me, when it comes to this journey that we call life, I feel like I'm just getting started. And so now I leave the good and the bad of the last decade behind me, and I will forgive and forget. I will build new bridges and tear down walls and live in the present. Just like Marcus's story, we all have a past, and that past defines us. Grizzly Adams, of all things, is what drew him to Canada to become the man he is today. A month after this hunt, Brett goes home, passes the bar, and becomes an attorney in Georgia. Everyone has a story, and here in this camp, there are stories written all over the walls and bed frames. When you read the names and dates, you can almost picture their faces, 
and their smiles and their stories, the peace that the British Columbia backcountry brought them. And if they were as lucky as me to share camp with a guy from Georgia and a man from Germany, well then I know for sure that they had the time of their lives. <laughs>